everyone. My name is Maria Thomas, and I work for Allianz Research, the global team of economists, strategists, sector advisors, and foresight experts of the Allianz Group, led by Ludovic Subron. Welcome to Tomorrow, a podcast where we'll be talking about our latest analyses of economic and capital market developments, as well as our views on trends affecting risk management. Let's get started. Is the ECB's climate talk having an effect on ESG bonds? In the last episode of this season, we speak to Andreas Jobst, Head of Macroeconomic and Capital Markets Research, and Senior Economist Roberta Fortes about their recent report on green monetary policy. Hello, Andy and Roberta. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Maria. Thanks for having us. Hi, Maria. Thank you. To start, can you explain for our listeners why climate change matters for central banks? Yeah, certainly, Maria, and thanks for uh, your interest in, in, in our recent paper. Uh, climate change in general um, is a, a highly complex subject, and uh, there's lots of uncertainty around, around you know, the, the scale and the progression of climate change. Um, but it, what we know with, with definite certainty is that without effective mitigation and adaptation, uh, climate change will be catastrophic for future generations. And... Climate change does have profound macro financial implications, uh, and those implications really strike at the core of uh, the mandate of a central bank. Uh, in the case uh, of the ECB, that's uh, price stability. And we distinguish here two channels, right? The physical risk, uh, which is associated with climate change due to, you know, extreme weather events or resource scarcity, uh, disruptions to economic activity, um, that can cause disruptions to growth and, and also increase uh, inflation because of supply chain disruptions and, and then higher production costs, etc. And then the second element is the transition risk, uh, which relates to uh, policies that are aimed at mitigating uh, uh, emissions. So that's carbon pricing. Uh, carbon pricing can... Uh, make uh, goods and services more expensive and, as a result, uh, increase prices. Uh, And at the same time, we also see that some industries might um, suffer uh, from structural change uh, because they are engaged in carbon-intensive production uh, and activities, and uh, that might entail job losses. So overall, these two elements, physical and transition risk, then affect the central bank through growth and inflation. And it affects the central bank because uh, they can have uh, permanent impact on output and inflation. So that goes back to the ability of the central bank to uh, meet its mandate. But also it affects the communication of the central bank because if energy prices, for instance, remain high for a long period of time, then it could be uh, that headline, what we call headline inflation, um, uh, 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 being being very high while um, uh, core inflation for goods and services is lower or the other way around. But there could be some confusion in the, in the, in the public as to you know, what inflation rate matters for the central bank. And finally, it's financial risk management. Uh, what would a central bank do if a bank pledges uh, a security to access liquidity uh, that uh, depends on uh, uh, an issuer that is very much exposed to climate change. So how a central bank manages uh, counterparty risk affected by climate risk, that is also the third channel uh, that uh, affects the central bank. How can central banks incorporate climate-related risks into their policy frameworks? And what has the ECB in particular done so far? Yeah, central banks can can incorporate climate change risks in uh, various ways. Uh, one is, you know, in their forecasting models, um, the way, for instance, they project inflation dynamics. The second one is more operational. Um, that's uh, what I've just mentioned, for instance, you know, how you uh, amend um, your collateral framework in the way banks access central bank money by pledging certain securities, and those securities might be exposed to climate change. So they do uh, look at that. And then thirdly is um, using using really uh, the power of the central bank's 
uh, voice uh, and moral suasion, if you will, when it comes to fostering climate-related disclosures and, and transparency. Uh, so encouraging rating agencies to be clearer about how climate change affects credit risk. What has the ECB so done so far? Um, they had a strategy review in 22, um, um, or an action plan that, that uh, was informed by that uh, by the strategy review. And what came out of that uh, were concrete measures uh, that will be implemented until 24. And what's in place already uh, is uh, the rebalancing of uh, its uh, corporate uh, bond uh, portfolio uh, towards uh, or away from uh, emission intensive issuers. And the other one, uh, a concrete action the ECB has taken is that since uh, the middle of uh, last year, uh, it would uh, consider climate change risks in the way it applies haircuts uh, to corporate bonds that are accepted as collateral uh, to access liquidity. Your recent report focuses on the ECB's communication on climate change risks and whether it impacted market prices. How have you tackled this question? Hi, Maria. Thanks for the question. As Angie just mentioned, the ECB has taken a number of measures that could have a direct impact on the corporate segment. So in this article, we focused on analyzing the impact of the ECB's communication on ESG corporate and agency bonds and how they are priced relative, relatively to uh, conventional bonds. An interesting thing to note in this market is that the ESG bonds tend to trade at a negative premium, which is called in the market as the guineo meaning that investors are likely to accept lower yields to hold a green bond. And from an issuer's perspective, this is interesting because it means that uh, finance costs are lower. So in the paper, what we did is that we applied tax mining techniques to a set of ECB's communication, such as speeds, press conferences, and interviews, and we were able to extract the main topics of interest for the central bank over time, among which there were clearly climate-related topics that have become more frequent in the last three years, and you can really see this uh, from the data. We then use these uh, quantitative signals to evaluate uh, the influence of the ECB's climate talk on the green that I had just men mentioned before. So we find that the climate talk has contributed to an increase in the green for example, almost uh, for example, almost fifty percent of the um, the change in the green of in the past year can be explained by this climate talk, which means that the ECB is creating more favorable conditions for ESG issuers, and this is particularly important in a period of rising interest rates. How should we interpret these findings from a technical perspective? Why these uh, results are quite promising, and they show that the ECB can indeed influence the financial markets and potentially create the good conditions for the green transition, they have to be interpreted with some uh, caution, because in the paper we work first with a very short sample, we are talking about one and three years period, because this coincides with this time when the ESB started to talk more effectively about this, about uh, climate issues. Huh? And the second thing to consider here is that we work with a monthly sample, and this is due to the high volatility of the quantitative signals extracted from the ECB communication, which can make it difficult uh, to capture uh, significant effects on the markets with a daily or even uh, weekly frequency. Moreover, the significant result observed in this, the shorter sample, the one-year period, may also reflect a recent increase in the demand for green bonds. So we had to control for other variables here. So this is regarding the empirical approach. But more broadly speaking, we, it should be noted here that we're dealing with a period in which there were seven potential regime change uh, crises notably the COVID-19 and also the russian ukraine war. These are major um, global shocks, and they may have influenced the loss of significance of central bank communication in the longer three-year sample. Huh? But here, overall, to sum, sum up, why only future research can uh, will be really able to, to prove our results, uh, for example, as we are going to have more data, we are going to have a larger sample, we can definitely say that the green policy adopt, adopted by the ECB seems to be on a good track 
it seems to be an important tool for the green transition and sustainable development. My last question is, what are the lessons from your study and what should the ECB do going forward? Yeah, thanks, Maria. I think Roberta said it well. Uh, and let me just put in a nutshell, um, the, the, the climate talk uh, uh, of the ECB seems to pay off. Uh, and this effective communication on, on climate, climate talk, um, uh, paired with uh, concrete actions, such as pivoting the asset purchases away from issues with high carbon footprint and including ESG bonds in a collateral framework, that, that, that is a powerful combo. And uh, we see that in our results. Um, and this bodes well for nudging markets uh, towards uh, an efficient or more efficient pricing of climate change risks. Uh, is it enough? One might ask, well, probably not, right? Because at the end of the day, the ECB and its actions can only supplement what fit, what is a main, the main fis, the main job of fiscal policy when it comes to the green transition, right? But it's a very uh, important supplement uh, to um, in the in the range of uh, policy channels uh, Europe needs to deploy uh, to make uh, climate action relevant and effective. So, so what we see in in summary is that. Uh, if we uh, acknowledge and address climate change risks uh, in the operating framework of a central bank, in, the, in this case, the ECB, um, it is possible that the central bank can fulfill its mandate of maintaining price stability, but at the same time, but at the same time, also support uh, broad economic objectives, in this case, sustainable development, uh, but also financial stability uh, without uh, without prejudice. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Armani. Thank you. That's a wrap for this season of the Tomorrow Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with fresh episodes after the summer. In the meantime, you can read all our research on Allianz.com. See you soon. Mm-hmm.